do you do you do you do you do you do you Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the Fusion Driven Rocket. Uh, John Slaw is the fellow in this program. I'll be here presenting. Uh, we have John uh, and the rest of the NSNW team. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to quickly go through some background, talk about the benchmarks of the FDR program so far, and then continue on to tell you a little bit about our research plan in phase two. Before I get into a lot of the technical and programmatic stuff, uh, of, uh, of our phase two, I want to talk about what is the uh, impetus of this work. Why are, are why do we think uh, FDR is a revolutionary technology? So the question I pose is why are we not on Mars yet? And I think we can sum this up basically with two large problems. One, it takes too long, and two, it just costs too much money. This might sound like an oversimplification, but I think as we break this down, we can see that these two main topics really. Uh, encompass a lot of the challenges associated with going to Mars. So if a trip takes too long, there's radiation exposure risks, cancer level go up, uh, bone and muscle loss for long durations in space, in zero gravity. There's also mental fatigue of the astronauts on being in confined spaces for long periods of time. Uh, not to mention that, that long missions also run higher risks of critical failure, so this happened, it has to over that length of time. These could all be summed up as kind of a safety issue. Uh, also, there are issues that, about taking too long uh, for, your, for your missions, that there's governmental support issues, uh, as well as public interest issues. I think we learned in the Apollo era and following on after that. Uh, so we, we kind of sum all those up into political issues. As far as cost is concerned, uh, big missions have large operational costs. We also have a lot of complexity, usually. Um, you look at the International Space Station, um, we're talking about very, very large uh, space assemblies and pre, pre deployed assets for a lot of the Mars missions. Uh, just worth a note that, that both of these uh, challenges go up. The costs go up because the mission takes a long time. So the longer the mission, the higher your operational costs are going to be. Those can be some of as direct costs. We also have indirect costs, uh, such as the mass, getting those masses to orbit. Uh, if we're building large space structures, we have to bring them up into space. Uh, and then using uh, basically the propellants and the chemical propulsion systems we have available today, uh, we need large amounts of fuel on orbit. So these are basically our launch costs, our indirect costs. So there's a lot of problems associated here, um, and, and we're proposing here is that the solution is all through propulsion, that a new propulsion method is needed that can overcome uh, a lot of these challenges that are presented here. Uh, this propulsion system needs uh, to enable short trip times, and it also needs to reduce uh, the amount of mass, uh, the initial mass at VO. So how do we do that? Uh, well, in the propulsion community, uh, we have a high specific power. This is the uh, engine power, or the spacecraft mass, or alpha. Uh, by having a high specific power, we can shorten our trip times. And then to reduce the amount of material uh, we need on LEO, we need a high exit velocity, or a high ISP. So what we're proposing uh, to do this, the technology, uh, is the fusion-driven rocket. And I'm going to quickly try to describe the concept on how the fusion-driven rocket works. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to use the high energy storage of fusion materials, and we want to use the light propellant of lithium to get the high ISPs. Uh, so two major components here is we have an uh, FRC plasma. This is our fusion material. And we have our drive coils. These are our uh, metallic lithium liners that are basically our propellant. And what we do is we inject our plasmoid or our uh, fusion material, and we collapse uh, using these driver coils the lithium blanket <coughs> around that fusion material. The blanket comes in with a lot of inertia and a lot of energy, enough energy to compress the uh, fusion material uh, into a critical condition, uh, and fusion occurs. When the energy is released from the from the fusion materials. Uh, is it then absorbed by that lithium blanket that acts to heat that blanket, vaporize and ionize that blanket. Um, those ionization products are then uh, exhausted out through a magnetic nozzle, creating our thrust. So the method I just described to you, the type of fusion I just described, uh, is basically a form of magneto-inertial fusion. Uh, there are many different types of fusion uh, that can be used for propulsion. Uh, over the last 50 years, people have come out and presented ideas 
Uh, magneto inertial fusion is very uniquely suited for space application uh, because of its low energy requirements. It, it, it basically is a lightweight uh, form of fusion that could actually be done in space. Uh, there are two different approaches to magneto inertial fusion. Um, there was what's called uh, magnetized target fusion, and then what we're presenting for FDR is the uh, foil liner compression fusion. I won't go into a lot of the details here, there's just a lot of information here. Um, but what I just did want to highlight is one of the major differences between these two concepts um, is that while uh, MTF has very close proximity, so both the plasma injector and the liner implosion system are very, very close to the fusion reaction. Uh, in FDR, we have the ability to uh, inject uh, the FRC far back behind the reaction chamber, as well as have our drive coils uh, a significant distance away from the nuclear uh, the fusion reaction. Uh, and a lot more that talks about this fusion, um, the different types of fusion, in particular you know, inertial fusion, can be found in one of our references from uh, this summer. Uh, so in summary, before uh, I finish up the background, um, I want to make this point that FDR offers uh, one of the first real realistic approaches for fusion-based propulsion, and it does this by uh, particularly these five benefits. Uh, one, uh, the fusion-driven rocket uh, directly transfers fusion energy into the propellant. There's no complicated uh, energy conversion cycles. Uh, this leads to high efficiency in a very low-mass engine. Uh, two, we're using solid propellant. We're talking about lithium propellant. High ISPs, uh, in particular, no, or very, very small tank extraction because it is solid lithium. Uh, we get very, very high exit velocities. Again, this is a short trip time for very, very high energies. Um, it has a low mass fraction, and it allows us to put very small payloads in orbit to do these missions. Uh, and then, like I kind of alluded to before on the previous slide, we do have magnetic uh, installation of our system. Um, this helps reduce uh, the interaction between the fusion products and the spacecraft. This lowers our thermal uh, load problems and reduces our radiator mass. And finally, like I mentioned about IMIF, um, MIF, is that it's a very appropriate scale fusion for space propulsion. Uh, so I'm going to move on now and talk about uh, our benchmarks of our current program. This is the research we've, we've been conducting and kind of have done to date. Uh, we originally started out with some very simple uh, initial mission studies. What we did is we took the uh, basic rocket equation, we coupled it with some of our fusion equations. Um, there's about 10 equations in all. I'm not going to show them all. Uh, but we can solve all these equations simultaneously in the code. Uh, and we can take a look at things like uh, payload mass fraction and uh, initial spacecraft uh, weights or masses. Some of our fusion assumptions, uh, we, we took into account the ionization costs and losses to ionize lithium. Uh, we coupling efficiencies and thrust efficiencies. And as far as our mission parameters or mission assumptions go, what we did is we took uh, DRM, DRA5 uh, payload, mass, payload mass to Mars, which is a 61 metric tons. This includes a habitat, an aeroshell, and some descent vehicles. Um, another thing worth noting is we took very realistic numbers for both the mass of the capacitors and the mass of the solar panels. Uh, we're not extrapolating out. This, this system is 10, 20 years out. What we're saying is that we can use uh, current off-the-shelf waste energy components to make this fusion rocket a reality. Uh, what this initial study showed, um, you can see from the plot up here in the upper right, uh, which is the plot of fusion gain versus trip time. No real big surprise here. The longer the trip time, the higher payload mass fractions you could deliver. The higher the gain, the higher uh, payload mass fractions you could deliver. So what we did is we looked at actually a 90-day case. Uh, so if you take um, 90 day transfer to Mars, and we looked at different burn times for that 90 days. So on this plot here at the bottom, burn time, a 90 day burn would be a continuous burn throughout the entire trajectory, um, whereas lower cases you're only doing small, almost impulsive burns. Um, what we kind of showed is that there's actually a burn time optimum of about 10 days for an Earth to Mars transfer using a fusion driven rocket. Um, this optimum uh, comes about due to solar panel scaling. Uh, that basically, as you go to faster burn times, you need higher power, higher higher power levels, which require larger, uh, larger solar panels, which increase your mass. And there's a trade-off there. Um, this work is presented in much more depth at the JPC this summer. Uh, and that paper is available uh, if you're interested in looking more into this initial mission study work. 
Where we took this after that uh, was we, we turned that basically 90 day one way transfer uh, into a, a kind of a full mission architecture, which is a 210 day round trip manned mission to Mars. And to do this, we did a mission down approach. So what we did is we took our fusion equations, which linked our energy input and our gain, and uh, determined where our ISP was. And that's what this plot shows here. It shows uh, ISP versus various fusion gains. We looked at this chart, and we said that about 5,000 seconds worth of ISP, which correlates with a gain of about 200, were both reasonable numbers from a mission perspective, as well as what can be expected from fusion reaction. Uh, so doing that, we, we have an ISP. Uh, we can calculate our input power, because our solar panel size. We have a gain, and we, uh, based on a certain rep rate, we have a jet power out about uh, 36 uh, megawatts of jet power. Um, we also took some liberties and estimated uh, what the spacecraft mass would be. And again, we're using the payload from the DRA-5 missions. So with all of this information, uh, we plugged this into Copernicus, which is a NASA code for doing trajectory uh, optimization. And we were able to kind of optimize this 210-day round trip mission. Uh, what came out to be interesting is you can see that uh, the trip to Mars optimized a little less than nine, nine days, about uh, 83 days, and the return trip is actually a little longer. Uh, and you'll also notice uh, one of the key important facts is their actual initial mass on orbit. Um, so FDR, for this mission design, is a single launch to orbit with only 134 metric tons, which is within the capabilities of the next generation heavy launch vehicles. Uh, and the round trip time is about 210 days. Uh, if those numbers don't surprise you, um, I suggest you go look at the DRA uh, 5, I think it's actually 5.1 or 5.5. This is with the nuclear thermal propulsion, not just chemical. Um, but those missions require uh, nine launches to orbit. They require uh, 850 metric tons in LEO. And the total mission time with pre-deployed assets is something around 1,700 days. Uh, so we're talking about a very, very big shift in mission architecture here. I go into a little bit more depth what this mission looks like. Um, what we have here is this actually from Copernicus. Uh, the mission trajectory, as you can see here, Earth and Mars, leaving and arriving, rendezvous for 30 days, and then the return trip. <coughs> there are four impulsive maneuvers. Uh, our trans-Earth is about seven kilometers per second and about seven day burn time. Uh, to rendezvous, to slow down at Mars, we're talking about a delta V of about 13 kilometers per second. I will mention at this point that we did look at aero braking and compared the advantages of using an aero brake system over a propulsive braking system. Uh, and in every scenario we looked at, um, because of the high efficiencies of the fusion driven rocket, it was almost always worth it to propulse or to brake propulsively. Uh, and then to leave Mars, we actually have our largest delta V of about 17 kilometers per second. Uh, that's for the trans Earth injection. And then again, uh, an Earth capture. Um, which is done compulsively, no arrow break or arrow capture there. Uh, these are just plots of the, the delta V budget, uh, sums up to about 50 kilometers per second worth of delta V, and then our mass budget. Um, you can see here our initial mass is about 134 metric tons, this is our payload drop of our deliverables, and then our return trip. With a very well defined uh, mission, the seven month mission, we were able to start taking a look at what the spacecraft would look like. And like I mentioned before, we took an estimate of about 15 metric tons for the weight of the spacecraft. Um, you can see here we tried to break this down by components uh, and give uh, at least a preliminary estimate of what we think those components would be. I won't go through the complete list, um, but just to highlight some, uh, some important uh, subcomponents. Energy storage, again, we use realistic numbers of one kilojoule per kilogram as far as the mass of capacitors. Um, and then we took very, very realistic numbers for switching and cabling. You see here energy storage is uh, 1.8 metric tons. We basically doubled that for switches um, and capacitors just to make sure that we covered our mass budget. Uh, and then solar panel, again, um, these are scaled appropriately at current level and current sizes and capabilities of solar panels. Uh, the important takeaway here is our, is our mass fraction. For that seven month mission, uh, the 210 day mission, uh, our mass fraction uh, to Mars is about 57% payload mass fraction. Okay, so moving away from the, the mission design and uh, the spacecraft design, we'll talk a little bit more about the fusion aspect uh, of FDR and some of the work we're doing at MSNW. 
Uh, one of the major uh, tools we're using now is a uh, 1D liner code. Uh, we developed this code in house. It's basically uh, a simple source free LRC circuit that drives our magnetic coils. Uh, one of the important parameters to notice here that these are very simple basic uh, circuit equations, but one of the things we did have to add is the changing conductance. Um, because the liner is moving away from the drive coil, as the liner moves away, the circuit inductance changes. That's kind of unusual on these circuit problems, so we did have to add uh, a parameter there. Uh, this model incorporated a lot of physics. It was very robust. We added uh, the ability to do a large number of waveforms, including ringing circuit, a uh, probar circuit, and a diode circuit. Uh, this code also was able to calculate uh, magnetic flux diffusion through the liner. So as you fire these coils, you form a very large driving field outside the coil. Some of that field seeps through inside the coil, uh, or sorry, inside of the liner. And so we were able to calculate all of that. Um, we found it was a very, very heavy, depends on resistivity. So we quickly went to uh, an experimental uh, function for resistivity as a function of temperature, all the way from sub-zero temperatures uh, up to its vaporization limit. Uh, we incorporated latent heats, uh, radiated cooling, and then this whole code was then energy balanced to make sure that the energy in the system was conserved. Uh, all of the parameters for this model were, were either taken from uh, actual uh, measured hardware, or they were uh, derived from ANSYS models or 3D models where we could actually make measurements of things like inductance uh, and magnetic field. The result of this uh, code basically gave us all of our liner dynamics. It gave us our acceleration, it gave us our velocity, it gave us uh, the position or the, the radius of the liner as a function of time. I'm not going to go into too much detail about all that. I will mention here though, uh, I thought this is worth showing, in particular is our liner resistance. Again, this is a function of time as this liner is moving inwards towards the center, towards our fusion products. Um, you can see that a lot of the physics come out uh, as far as uh, the late heat. Uh, and then the phase change causes a jump in the resistivity, and then as the cross section basically as the liner collapses, the cross section gets smaller, uh, our resistivity goes down. Uh, so the code is very, very robust in its physics. Without going towards detail, I'll kind of jump to the conclusions of this code, what we kind of learned from this code um, current day. Uh, so the equation at the top there is the yield. Uh, yield is basically the fusion energy out from the reaction versus the energy input into that reaction. Um, and as you can see here, it's very highly dependent on uh, B field, as well as uh, a couple of geometric parameters, radius and length, and then what's known as a dwell time. Uh, dwell time is basically the amount of time the products are at a condition where fusion can occur. Um, we're saying, uh, for simplicity of this model, that the dwell time is about 70% of the peak compression range. So the plot here, the, the temperature plot you see down here, is a plot of voltage. Uh, versus capacitance, and showing uh, yield. And as you can see here, uh, for our drive coils, uh, for our liners, if we can charge to about 40 kilovolts, which is currently our capability in house, and per liner we have about uh, 420 microfarads worth of capacitor, uh, we can achieve uh, a yield of about 0.1, in the 0.1 range. Uh, this is currently the, the limit of the capabilities that we have in house at MSNW. Uh, you'll notice that there's this, this high high temperature peak here. These are your optimal conditions. Um, funny enough, these correlate with about an energy of about 500 kilojoules. Um, you know, those you know about uh, energy storage capacitors, right? You go up with capacitance, um, more energy, and it goes to voltage squared energy. So that's actually a, a voltage squared curve, um, about 500 kilojoules worth of energy. What we're pursuing now uh, is we'd like to actually get closer to these higher yield situations. Uh, so we're talking um, with NASA Marshall. They have about 48 uh, 17 micro uh, ferret capacitors that we'd like to add to our system. By doing so, it'll allow us to operate close to this peak uh, and basically move around within this area and make sure that we can hit these high field cases. Um, so if we do get those capacitors from Marshall, it'll greatly enhance uh, based our results in phase two and what we can show experimentally. Um, one interesting point of note, uh, this graph has a lot of interesting physics in it and why this 500 kilojoules is optimal. Um, 
basically real quick uh, to explain that is this is a, a plot of the internal energy, basically the field inside uh, the, the, the foil as it collapses uh, versus time. And as you can see, that even though you have a large initial field or initial soak through, what really matters is how well you get right before the uh, critical point when, when massive compression occurs. Uh, I can talk more about this later, but I'm going to keep up moving through the presentation to some time for questions. Uh, so, in addition to the 1D model, we did do a 3D ANSYS model. Um, ANSYS uh, explicit dynamics, but we modeled the same geometries. Uh, this was the first 3D compression simulation of a thick metallic liner. I uh, showed that there was no gross instabilities within that liner due to the rigid, the rigid nature of the liners themselves. Uh, the forces that were applied on that liner are well be, uh, beyond the plastic yield strength of the material, and therefore had a uniform compression. And finally, one of the more uh, interesting points is that there was very little internal energy in that liner. So as these liners came in, um, there wasn't a lot of extra energy <coughs> in the internal energy of the liner itself. This is very, very different than what has been seen in plasma compression and thick liner compression to try to get the very high magnetic fields. Uh, and then most importantly, we did find that the, the 3D ANSYS model would be very, very well with our hit mass 1D model would be developed. Uh, so quickly, uh, of course, the programmatic stuff, uh, just our, our research plan moving forward. Uh, we have four main tasks, uh, the first of which, uh, probably the most important of which, is our uh, experimental results. You can see here, uh, this is MSNW's uh, FDR validation experiment, which is now currently under construction and underway. Um, you can see here, these are two coils, kind of hard to see in the picture, and drive one of the uh, connection plates. On the left here, there's another one on the other side. I feel like the CAD drawing can get a little bit closer to look. We do have uh, FRC formation sections on the side as well as pumping. Um, and from the cross section, you can see we have our two drive coils and the liners, and we have two liners coming in collapsing uh, in the center of that chamber. We set a very aggressive set of milestones uh, for this work, for the experimental work. Uh, in the next six months, we will have this full setup tested. Uh, at pulse power system operating at, at rated voltage. Uh, within a year, we'll be operating with two liners. Um, and then probably the biggest milestone of the phase two work will be uh, at a year and a half, we plan on showing uh, mega gauss worth of field compression. And then finally, at the conclusion of the, of the uh, two year program, we do want to have FRC operation. Uh, in conjunction with the experimental work, we will continue <coughs> our analytical and numerical work. Uh, most importantly, the liner dynamic trade studies. Uh, I talked a little bit about our liner dynamic code. Uh, we will continue developing that code, and we'll use it to study things like different energies, uh, different uh, magnetic pulse shapes, different bias fields, basically within the within the liner, geometry scales, mass and temperatures. We can look at all these things and kind of optimize not only our experimental setup, but also apply that to the final FDR spacecraft engine. Uh, and that will be definitely uh, an analytical task coming up. Um, you see the milestones under year one. Um, right now, our code is, is doing aluminum liners because we're doing experimentally, but lithium liners that FDR will actually run on, so we'll be doing those analysis in the upcoming um, year. Um, and then we're going to add some more codes to our capabilities. We'll, we will be doing a full scale FDR engine analysis. This is a thermal analysis and a structural analysis of the actual engine itself. Uh, we'll plan to have that done by a year, by a year and a half. And then finally, um, we will uh, do at least some preliminary studies. Uh, on fusion neutronics and basically look at fusion spacecraft interaction and characterize that all by the second year, end of the second year. Uh, third task will be to continue our spacecraft design. This is a very similar chart to I showed earlier. We will extend um, these numbers and as we get more input back from our models and from our experiments, we'll come back and basically redesign and update uh, our spacecraft model and our FDR engine model. Uh, it's important to notice that a lot of these subcomponents are based on both mission and fusion uh, results. And so again, as we, as we get better numbers, they will reflect in this chart. Um, and then one of the important things that we think uh, is necessary, and we put here as our first milestone in the next six months, is to do uh, an initial TRL assessment. Basically look at all these subcomponents and decide um, what total readiness, readiness level they are at. And more importantly, uh, what major contributions or what major breakthroughs in the field are needed in order to take these subcomponents to higher levels. Uh, this will help give FDR a roadmap uh, and a path forward, uh, not only in its you know, uh, fusion liner physics, but all the, the subcomponents associated with that. 
Uh, and finally, just to skip down the, the, the final, uh, at the end of the two years, we were planning on having an overall spacecraft design um, documented and, and ready for, for NIAC in our final report. Uh, and finally, our, our fourth task will be to continue our mission study. Uh, we, we put some work into this and we'll continue to develop our, our single launch to Mars. Uh, from all of our feedback, this seven-month mission sounds very tractable uh, to NASA. So we'll refine that mission again with our, with our data that comes back as far as uh, fusion conditions. We'll look at longer stay missions, single trips. Uh, this might mean uh, an on-orbit assembly of one trip there. Or uh, there's the option of a pre-deployed mission. This is the DRA model, classic model, uh, where we have a precursor cargo mission. We can look at how we do that with FDR. Uh, and then, uh, maybe very ambitiously, is look at uh, the ultra-fast 30-day transfer. This would be something like a 90-day round trip to Mars. Uh, while the Delta V budgets are extremely high for this, they are certainly within the capability of a fusion-driven rocket. Uh, we can also take a look at other missions if there's interest as far as Jupiter. Uh, it does there's a lot of interest around NEO, uh, near Earth objects, so we can look at, can FDR be used for catching comets, doing sample returns, maybe even some redirection type applications. Uh, again, there's a whole bunch of milestones set forth for our mission um, analysis. Uh, most importantly is by the end of the two years, we will have a DRA-style report uh, to give to Jay, basically summarizing how we would do a Mars mission uh, and how it should be using the FDR engine. Uh, with that, I'm just going to conclude with our research plan. Um, this slide we, we put together to kind of show um, not only uh, where we are or where we came from with our phase one and where we're going in our phase two, but, but all the way up to a, a flight system. So we've projected uh, the estimates of, of our subcomponents and our TRL. Uh, the material of those components and how they will progress through each of these phases and each of the funding <coughs> available through NASA to hopefully get to uh, a flight qualified uh, system. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll conclude this talk and open it up to uh, any questions and discussion.
watt range, or megawatt range, those look pretty anemic to move heavy masses around. Don't you need gigawatts of thrust power, of jet power to make on this thing? Um, from our mission studies, we show that we do not. Um, you, you have extremely high gains, so we have small enough powers of hundreds of kilowatts. Like you mentioned, we have uh, tens of megawatts of output power, but at very, very high ISP. Uh, the ISPs of, of the exhaust products uh, we took for our mission output was about 5,000 seconds. Um, so, so in that analysis, we were able to perform um, very, very quick maneuvers. Again, you've got to realize that the, the payload here is, is 15 metric tons. So that, that's the size of that spacecraft, which is a, a considerably small spacecraft considered to a lot of other Mars missions. Like if you look at the DRA-5 mission, how big that spacecraft is, um, it, it's a very, it's very, very different. That you said you're moving 60 metric tons. So that's the payload. The, the spacecraft alpha, so that the, the jet power of the spacecraft would mass the spacecraft, right? That, that's our alpha. It's very, very large because the spacecraft itself is 15 metric tons. Um, we are moving a very, very large payload, um, and therefore we have a very, very high payload mass fraction. Uh, if you want, I can go through and I can actually show you the analysis that we've done. I suggest you take a look at our JPC paper, which kind of breaks down all of our initial studies and how this led up to our final 210-day mission. One, one final question. How many, how many uh, neutrons have you made so far? Uh, well, uh, there are uh, a number of DOE experiments that have led up to this concept. Uh, and John can comment more directly on that. Um, right now for this NIAC, what we're doing is uh, we're requesting that hardware and setting it up in this foil liner configuration. Um, that test facility is underway. I believe in the last couple of weeks we've actually put voltage on it uh, and started uh, voltage rating those capacitor banks for those dry coils. Just add on to what uh, was already spoken of it. Uh, you cannot absorb neutrons like that, as you were saying. 98% or 96% is very obvious if that's not done. Okay. I think the point he's trying to make is that 80% of the energy is absorbed, not the neutrons. <coughs> you're, you're correct in the mean free path for absorption is only very 10 centimeters. And so, you, you know, you, for several e things, you need 50 centimeters of insulation, uh, whether it be, or reflector is probably the most likely thing you do. So, as part of the spacecraft mass, you, you simply shield, you know, in the direction of the space crew with probably a meter or more. You can you, you use the lithium propellant as your shield. The idea is that you, you, you would just simply provide over the solid angle that is intercepted by the spacecraft uh, that the, the, the crew component, et cetera, with a meter thick. I mean, it, you know, this is standard nuclear insulation. It's nothing that nuclear. But you have low energy neutrons that you're actually shielding from. The, the energy, in other words, the energy transfer of, to the lithium propellant occurs in five centimeters or less. This has always been a conundrum of the fusion program is that all the energy from fusion gets absorbed very quickly in the first few centimeters of the blanket. It then takes, your blanket has to be a meter thick to, to, to slow the neutrons down for capture, to create tritium, et cetera. But basically, the requirement for the energy exchange is what we looked at, because that's all we're interested in in terms of propellant. The neutron shielding is easily done with a meter or so of water, whatever you like, graphite. So you shield for that. Okay, I have a live stream question which may or may not have just been answered, but I don't understand what any of you guys are saying, so <coughs> bear with me. Um, how are the lithium liners replaced repeatedly through the burn time in an operational engine? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, that, the concept behind that, um, if, if I go back to uh, the total TRL slides, sorry, the t uh, of the, the subsystems, uh, propellant feed mechanism, we are currently kind of estimating as a, as a TRL of two. Uh, from our analysis, we had shown that a rep rate of about uh, 0.1 hertz, or about a liner every 10 seconds, is the rep rate we need for the fusion driven rocket. Uh, so 10 seconds to replace the liner um, seems doable. Uh, with lithium, lithium is a very malleable metal. Uh, there are thoughts of doing 
uh, spray coating, but uh, turning it into a liquid, either painting it on or spraying it on, or doing extrusion to extrude the liner and slip it into place. Uh, there are a number of different mechanisms that can be used uh, to get the liner into place uh, at a very low, low rep rate, which we are planning. Uh, you also notice that we did uh, budget quite a bit of mass, um, 1.2 metric tons um, for that repellent heat mechanism, because right now there's a very, very large unknown. We know there's probably going to be a bulky uh, and heavy system to replace those liners. 